This web clip presents an introduction to functional MRI. My name is Brad Postel. I'm with the Departments of Psychology and Psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Now the experiment that's used to introduce some principles of fMRI in methodology 6.2 is a simple button pressing experiment. And here you can see a subject about to be slid into the scanner. The birdcage uh, head coil has been slid over his head and in his hands he has a response box with buttons on it. It's an MR compatible device and he will press those buttons with his thumbs once every 20 seconds when he's um, uh, signaled to do so with a visual um, prompt. Now recall from methodology box 2.1 which um, detailed m magnetic resonance imaging that different pulse sequences can emphasize different types of tissue and different ways of measuring the relaxation signal can yield different kinds of information about the tissue being imaged. So whereas methodology box 2.1 emphasized the role of the T1 signal for anatomical MRI, here we're going to be focused on a different relaxation signal. It's the so-called T2 star signal. And the T2 star signal is sensitive to changes in the level of oxygenation in the blood. And uh, as a result, it's often referred to as a hemodynamic uh, signal that we're measuring with functional MRI. Now here's a diagram from the paper from Menon and Kim that is um, uh, referenced in Chapter 6. And what the authors are showing you here is a hypothetical situation where in a patch of cortex there's a collection of neurons that are um, exhibiting elevated activity uh, relative to other neurons um, in the immediate vicinity. And whereas all of these neurons are um, receiving a steady flow of uh, oxygenated arterial blood, what you see is that there has been an increase in oxygenated blood being delivered to the neurons that are showing the elevated level of activity. And uh, most importantly, this activity-related increase in oxygenated blood is actually overcompensatory in the sense that more fresh arterial blood has been delivered to these neurons than um, their metabolic uh, requirements um, actually demand. And as a result, on the venous side, where blood is being taken up uh, from the capillary bed and into the veins, um, the, it's depicted in the vicinity of these active neurons as being slightly more red, um, which represents the fact that, um, that there's an elevated level of oxygenated hemoglobin um, in the, um, on the venous side of these uh, active neurons relative to the neurons that are not showing um, uh, an increased level in activity. And it's this uh, change in the proportion of oxygenated to deoxygenated blood that fMRI is sensitive to. Now because our subjects are performing a button pressing task, we're going to expect to see elevated levels of activity in the primary motor cortex. We'll learn about primary motor cortex in chapter 7, but it's located just uh, anterior to the central sulcus, which I'm showing you here. And of course, just posterior to the central sulcus is the postcentral gyrus, which is where the primary somatosensory cortex is located. We'll also expect to see activity in primary somatosensory cortex that's uh, associated with the sensation of a thumb pressing against a button. Now here's a visual representation of the independent variable, the covariate uh, being entered into the statistical model. Um, there's a spike uh, once every 20 seconds corresponding to each uh, button press that the subject is going to be asked to make over the course of this uh, 400 second long scan a six minute, 40 second long scan.
Now, because we know that the fMRI response, the hemodynamic response to a punctate event is not a spiky um, punctate response, such as being illustrated here, what we do is convolve the independent variable with a basis set of sines and cosines that's being superimposed here in red. Um, and this, uh, th this um, stick function or delta function convolved with this basis set will enable us to capture the variance in the signal that we expect to see in response to the button presses um, that the subject is going to make. Now indeed, here we see a statistical map. Um, the, the flex in yellow are voxels that the statistical model has elevated, has, has um, detected as showing elevated levels of activity. And you'll note that um, here is the central sulcus um, and there are clusters of activity in the central sulcus in the right hemisphere, in the left hemisphere in particular, excuse me, because the subject is making um, thumb presses with the right hand in this case. But there's also activity in many other parts of the brain, including back here in the occipital cortex and in many other regions. And so what we're going to do first is mask out activity from regions that we don't think are directly uh, involved in the behavior that we are measuring. And when we do that, now what I'm showing you is a region of interest that's restricted to the left hemisphere in the pre and post central gyri and so these voxels that are now uh, depicted in green are the voxels in the left hemisphere sensory motor cortex um, that show elevated activity that is time locked with the behavior that subjects were performing. This is the um, time series now of changes in fMRI signal that we measure over the course of this 400 second scan and you can see in this relatively raw data um, already there are several peaks and if you counted them up you would see 20 peaks associated with uh, the 20 button presses that subjects made. Now there's still some noise in the data there's drift for example where um, the, um, the central uh, tendency in the data for the first part of the scan uh, dropped off for a reason that's unrelated to the behavior that we asked the subjects to perform. And so statistically, when we clean up um, some of that noise, what you see in the black is the uh, fMRI response to the 20 button presses that subjects performed and superimposed on, on the dependent data is the um, statistical model's best estimate of what the response from these voxels looks like. And so um, because the uh, statistical estimate is necessarily uniform, because these are all, um, uh, each of these spikes is a part of the, the same covariate that was entered into the general linear model. And so this is the least squares best estimate of the shape of the, of the hemodynamic response. You can see the variability in the data themselves in that the excursions of some of these peaks are quite high relative to others. And there are also some peaks that are um, peaking earlier than the average of what we um, see across the entirety of the scan. And so, in order to obtain our best estimate of the average hemodynamic response in the subject, uh, we're going to generate a trial averaged time series. So to do that, we will take the data from time 0 to time 19, which corresponds to the first button press, uh, average it with the data from time 20 to time 39, and so on, so that when we average across these 20 events, um, we get a um, estimate and of the hemodynamic response from this subject. And this is what this estimate looks like for this particular subject. Um, note, of course, that the button press uh, 
took place, it was prompted at time zero, and it uh, it resolved itself almost sure, certainly um, within the first three to four hundred milliseconds. And yet the peak response with the fMRI is not detected until six seconds after the behavior occurred. So this is a decidedly sluggish uh, and smeary uh, hemodynamic response to a relatively punctate neural event. And in the parlance of signal processing, we can think of this as a low-pass filtered transform of the electrical and cell biological events that we really care about as cognitive neuroscientists. So here is a redepiction of the hemodynamic response from the previous slide. The only difference is that now I've interpolated the values between each of the sampled time points, which is to say that in the experiment we acquired a image of the uh, volume of the brain once every two seconds. Um, but we uh, know, of course, that the actual hemodynamic response is a continuous function. And so we try to capture that by uh, interpolating between the sampled time points uh, so that we can represent the hemodynamic response as a continuous function. Now, this concludes this web clip. And in the web clip that follows this one, which is 3.2, We'll pick up where we left off here by considering some implications of the low-pass filtering properties of the hemodynamic response for the design and interpretation of fMRI experiments.